All right, let's try this again. Good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you've had a quick chance for lunch. I jumped the gun on the intro to uh, the lunch uh, pediatric breakout session with the fading of the music right before this. But it was wonderful to be to see everybody uh, virtually as is. Uh, my name is Craig Gorgian. I'm uh, the Leslie A. Geddes Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering here at the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering at Purdue University. I'm thrilled to uh, co-lead the breakout session today for pediatric. Uh, regulatory medical devices and other issues in relation to, to pediatric disease. Uh, we have a great list of panelists um, that are going to be participating with us today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and hopefully we can do that quickly. Share. Okay. Let's go ahead and swap displays too. Um, David Reuter, can you see the, the slide okay? Does that look good to you? It looks great, yes. Fantastic, thank you. So right, this is the breakout session on pediatric devices. Um, all four of our panelists have experience in pediatrics, either from a device development or regulatory standpoint or both. Um, and with that, um, I'm thrilled to lead this. I, I lead a, a research group at Purdue in the Weldon School, primarily focused on cardiovascular disease. My research interests uh, primary lie uh, around uh, imaging with uh, high frequency ultrasound or high field MRI. Uh, we've got a lot of different projects on heart disease and vascular uh, defects, aneurysms and atherosclerosis. Um, but we've also gotten into uh, an interesting projects and in, related to reproductive health, vascular health and pediatrics, developing um, and, and trying to develop devices for pediatric populations as well as improving our imaging technologies for uh, pediatric patients. Uh, as Beyond the research efforts, I run the uh, and director of the clinical programs in the Weldon School. So we partner with IU School of Medicine, West Lafayette, IU School of Medicine, Indianapolis, and the other regional campuses around the state, uh, including a scholarly concentrations program for our, our medical students interested in biomedical engineering. And uh, with that, right, pediatrics has become a passion of ours as we're trying to build a consortium. Um, I've got a six and a three-year-old at home that keep us on our toes uh, in the house and uh, is really open to my eyes to healthcare, not only for uh, mothers that are expecting, but for little ones as we uh, try to get them up to be healthy adults. With that, um, I want to introduce the panelists. Um, first, uh, Dr. Vincent Devlin, uh, MD, is the Chief Medical Officer at, at, in the Office of Orthopedics um, at FDA. Currently serves um, in the Office of Health and Technology, six Office of Orthopedic Devices and FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Dr. Devlin obtained his undergraduate degree in pre-medical studies from Columbia University and doctor of medicine degree from the State University of New York Downstate Medical Center. Subsequent medical training included an orthopedic residency at the State University of New York Downstate Kings County Medical Center and spine fellowship training at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Devlin is certified by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery and is a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. His clinical practice focused on the diagnosis and treatment of pediatric and adult disorders involving the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. His research interests include sacro-pelvic fixation, intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring, and orthopedic device registry development. In 2010, Dr. Devlin joined FDA as medical officer, where he is involved in reviews and programs related to a wide range of orthopedic devices. Thank you, Dr. Devlin, for joining us today. Dr. David Reuter, uh, is a, a, an alum of our program, uh, at least in engineering school, um, and is a pediatrician out in Seattle. Dr. Reuter studied liberal arts at St. Andrew University in Scotland, uh, engineering at Purdue University, and received his PhD in bioengineering, also from Purdue, before attending medical school at Indiana University. He completed his pediatric residency at Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. Dr. Reuter worked at Seattle Children's Hospital in the emergency department for 15 years before joining Allegro Pediatrics in the fall of 2014. Dr. Reuter is an advocate for improving the lives of children. When he lost a patient to heart disease, he worked for decades to develop a cardiac implant for patients with heart failure. Dr. Reuter is currently spearheading a clinical trial in collaboration with Purdue and IU School of Medicine to solve preeclampsia, which is pregnancy-associated hypertension. My lab is collaborating with Dr. Reuter on that project. It's been a great uh, success so far and something we've really enjoyed. He also loves caring for kids and feels that partnering with families to help children reach their full potential is a tremendous and rewarding privilege. Uh, Dr. Reuter, thank you for joining today. Yep. Dr. Susan Elpert um, is the principal uh, and consultant uh, of SFA Regulatory, um, former corporate VP at Medtronic, uh, is, is um, 
working currently now at a one person firm, firm focused on strategies needed for uh, to, to place medical devices and other medical products into the global market. She was a corporate senior VP for global regulatory at Medtronic Incorporated and prior to that, um, VP of regulatory sciences at CR Bar Incorporated. She previously worked at the US FDA where she held a variety of management positions in the centers uh, for centers dealing with drug devices and radiological health and foods. She was director of the Office of Device Evaluation from 1993 to 1999. Dr. Elpert is a microbiologist and pediatrician with a specialty in infectious disease. She completed her undergraduate degree at Barnard College, Columbia University, New York City, holds a master's degree and PhD in biomedical sciences from NYU, and a medical degree from the University of Miami, Florida. She's a member of several nonprofit and for-profit boards. So, Dr. Alper, thank you very much for joining. And then finally, uh, Dr. Nicole Ibrahim, uh, you can see from the slide here, she's the director of the Div Division of Circulatory Support, Structural and Vascular Devices in the Office of Cardiovascular Devices at the FDA, where she provides regulatory oversight for pre and post market activities for medical devices in her division. She's involved in several internal and external efforts to promote pediatric device development for cardiovascular applications. She joined the FDA in 2009 as a pre-market reviewer in the Division of Cardiovascular Devices and served as the branch chief for the Structural Heart Devices branch, where her work as branch chief included oversight of products such as heart valve repair and replacement devices, occluders and pediatric structural heart devices. Prior to FDA, she received her BS in bioengineering from Rice University in Texas and her PhD in bioengineering from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Dr. Ibrahim, thank you for joining as well. So with that, um, instead of just jumping right into discussion, we, we actually, I asked all the panelists to put together a few example case studies and main takeaway points from their experience that they wanted to cover first. So Dr. Ibrahim is gonna go first. I'm gonna try to advance the slides when she tells me to. Uh, all four of our panelists have prepared about 10 minutes worth of content. And then the rest of the time, we really want to make this as interactive as possible. So if we could work with um, everybody that's participating today, please put your questions in the chat and then ask as well uh, if you'd like to have uh, your, your line unmuted and, and your video on, you can ask uh, questions to make a, a real discussion of this so that uh, we can delve into what how regulatory um, considerations should be made for pediatric devices that are different from adults. So with that, Dr. Ibrahim, I'll go to your first slide and you can take it from here. Great, thank you. Um, I, I don't see the first slide. The slide that I see still says um, Dr. Susan Alpert on it. Mm. So I'm not sure if we're seeing. <laughs> okay, one second. Let me see if I can stop sharing, share screen and then get to. Is that any better? Yes, I yes. think that's, that's it. Okay. okay, sorry. I think it froze for me for a second. No, no worries. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the to the organizers um, of this uh, great workshop um, for inviting me. Um, the, the content that I've prepared here is not necessarily intended to be a cohesive presentation per se, um, but in our prior discussions um, as the uh, members of the panel, we discussed maybe highlighting um, some areas in the regulatory uh, framework that um, have been either established or are intended to, to really promote um, and help um, encourage pediatric device development. So the slides I have here um, kind of describe a couple of different regulatory programs and aspects um, that are currently in play um, that the FDA is, uh, is using to try to help get some of these devices to market for pediatric patients. So. The first one that I wanted to highlight is um, the HDE program, which is the Humanitarian Device Exemption Program. Um, and it's, it's a little bit different from the traditional pre-market approval pathway. Um, and so I've provided a table here that kind of shows a comparison between those two programs. So um, that, you know, the statutory bar uh, for approval for a PMA device or class three PMA um, is to establish safety and effectiveness of the device. Whereas for HDE, it's the, the, uh, the bar is really safety and probable benefit. Um, and that's to say that, that the device is, is exempt from the effectiveness requirement, but still has to demonstrate some degree of benefit um, in order to reach the market. Um, there are also um, restrictions related to the number of patients that can be treated under an HDE. So for a PMA, there are, are no restrictions 
but humanitarian device exemption um, is really limited to devices that are going to treat less than 8,000 patients per year. And prior to pursuing an HDE as a marketing application or marketing submission, um, a, a company would need to apply for what's called a humanitarian use device designation or a HUD designation. Um, and they have to submit uh, documentation and analysis and evaluation that shows um, based on either epidemiology or, um, or literature that, uh, that, that the disease or condition that they're going to treat with the device um, it, it affects less than 8,000 patients per year. Um, there are, for a PMA, there are no restrictions in, in terms of comparability um, uh, of devices on the market. So, you know, we might have 10 PMAs for a uh, drug eluting stent. And so a drug eluting stent would not qualify for an HDE because the HDE program is really centered on devices for which there's no um, comparable uh, or available alternative. Um, there, uh, the restrictions, there are restrictions that are placed on HDE devices for the amount that a company can charge. Um, under the PMA program, there's no restriction, but for HDEs in general, um, there were restrictions on the amount that the company or the profit that could be made um, it, um, for a particular device. About um, 10 plus years ago, more than 10 years ago now, um, they listed the restrictions for pediatric devices. And so now there are currently no restrictions under the HDE pathway for pediatric devices. Um, another requirement for HDE devices is that in order to use them, a physician needs to obtain IRB approval from their institution. This is a fairly unique requirement um, because I think it uh, can sometimes create um, some uh, degree of, of hurdle in gaining access to a device. Um, but because the, the um, requirement for effectiveness has been lifted, um, input from the IRB and approval from the IRB was sort of established as a way to um, mitigate um, that particular issue. And then the last thing is the user fees. So PMAs have a user fee associated with them, but HDEs are a free application. Next slide. So that's kind of a basic uh, uh, framework of, of um, application types that could apply for pediatric devices, at least in the class three realm. Um, there have been a number of guidance documents that have been put out by the FDA to try to promote, uh, again, um, uh, pediatric device development and on-label use of pediatric devices. And so one of the areas um, back in 2015 or 16 that was established was this concept of extrapolation of effectiveness. And so it's basically a determination of pediatric effectiveness that's based on a, a similar course of disease or condition uh, that exists um, for the device in adults. So uh, you can imagine that if there's a, a, a device on the market that was um, developed and approved for, de for uh, adults, there may be a, a, you know, a, a cohort of data or a volume of data that supports the use in adults. Um, if that uh, device were, one, were to be sought for a pediatric indication, um, the, the concept of, of extrapolation of effectiveness is essentially to utilize some of the adult data to support a pediatric indication. Um, and so if the disease course is really similar between adults and pediatrics, and we think that the effectiveness is leverageable and is applicable to the pediatric use, then we can use it um, as a means of establishing effectiveness for pediatrics. Um, I will note that this doesn't apply necessarily to safety. So if FDA feels that um, there are different risks or um, different adverse events that might be observed in a pediatric population that we might not expect in an adult population, um, we may ask for an additional um, supplemental cohort of data that establishes the safety element in pediatrics. And so this, um, I think, is something that ha I've been used over the last few years in order to support a few applications. Next slide. The other program area that I think um, has really, I think, uh, become more robust and um, stronger over the years is this concept of pre and post market balance, where you know we've um, established this paradigm of pr the potential for shifting some pre market data needs into the post market setting, and it's really aimed at looking at a total life cycle approach to understanding the benefit risk profile of devices. Um, and so it, it essentially relies on this concept that we might be able to accept a greater degree of uncertainty for probable benefits or risks 
And that's really balanced by the benefit of having earlier access to a particular device because either there are no alternatives available or um, maybe there's limited use um, of the device. Um, and so it, the, the, this uh, shift in the balance between pre and post market, I think is a really important concept, particularly for pediatrics. Um, and it, it has um, in, in recent years resulted in, um, in pediatric patients, I think gaining access to, to devices that might, might, other not, might otherwise not have reached the market um, if it hadn't been for um, careful thinking through that pre post market balance. Next slide. The Breakthrough Devices Program is another one that I think um, you know, FDA has um, increasingly utilized over the last few years um, to um, help uh, encourage pediatric device development. So the Breakthrough Devices Program, if you aren't familiar with it, it's a voluntary program for devices um, that um, allows for a designation of a device when it provides for more effective treatment or diagnosis of a life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating disease or condition. Um, and like I said, the goal is to try to increase uh, access and timely access to novel and innovative technologies. Um, there are criteria that have been established for the program. On the next slide. There are two criteria that have to be met for the breakthrough designation. Um, first is that it provides for a more effective treatment or diagnosis of a life-threatening disease um, and the second criterion is, is, is around this concept of a novel technology. So does it represent a breakthrough in technology for, for that particular patient population or indication? Um, are, are there no approved alternatives that exist? Um, it might offer significant advantages over existing alternatives, um, or it might just be in the best interest of patients. Um, and I would say there are a number of pediatric devices that are in development, at least in the cardiovascular space, that have re received a breakthrough designation in the last few years. Um, I will note that um, the, the breakthrough program uh, applies to uh, PMA devices, um, 5 k devices, and de novo de devices. Uh, but, it, but right now, the, the program doesn't allow for designation for HDE devices. So that's a, a distinction that I think is um, relevant um, to this particular um, area. Next slide. So I, I put on here a couple of case studies that I thought were illustrative of devices, pediatric devices that um, were um, commercialized based on data that incorporated some of the concepts and some of the programs that I just um, spoke about. So, um, and I'm from the Division of, of um, Circulatory Support Structural and Vascular Devices in Cardiovascular. And so all of my examples are cardiovascular. So I'll apologize in advance, but I think there are some uh, lessons learned that are still applicable uh, across the spectrum. Um, so the first uh, case study is um, the St. Jude or, or now Abbott um, Master Series Mechanical Heart Valve. Um, and this valve has been around for decades um, and is sort of the, a staple in mechanical heart valves. Um, but it was largely developed for um, and developed and studied in adults um, because of the larger sizes that were available. Um, and it wasn't until um, about a decade ago that uh, development of a small, smaller device that could be implanted in neonates um, was, was developed. Uh, and so the question that kind of came up is, well, how do we gather the data and what type of data do, they, do we need to support approval in what, what is one, a very small patient population, but two, is a very, um, a very difficult population to enroll in trials and to, um, to follow and to gather data from. Um, because if, for folks that aren't aware um, in the audience, the typical heart valve study that we would require for uh, a mechanical heart valve like this um, is, uh, requires on the order of 800 patient years. Um, it includes patients that, are both, that have implants both in the mitral valve position as well as in the aortic valve position. Um, and for a pediatric population to gather this volume of data um, is, is quite onerous, um, if even possible, um, based on the numbers that, that we uh, uh, know about. So we had to develop a creative approach. Otherwise, there was um, this device probably wouldn't have made it to the market. Um, and so what we, what we determined based on the population is that we required a total of 20 implants 
um, in the mitral position because that's the more common implantation site for this particular valve in this population. Um, the mean age of the patients was seven, uh, about seven months. Um, and so these were de very delicate patients um, that uh, were difficult to follow, difficult to, um, to kind of carry out through your typical follow-up in, in a heart valve study. Um, and so in addition to that, um, we also, in addition to the 20 patients that supported the approval, um, we also relied on uh, some supplemental data from emergency and compassionate use cases, and you can see the numbers here. So quite a reduced set from, um, from what we would expect for adults. But the idea was that we had learnings from the adult data, from the studies that had been done in prior uh, decades from the adult sizes that we felt were leverageable in terms of performance for the valve. And what, we're, what we were really interested in is understanding um, the safety profile um, and, and supplemental effectiveness, um, essentially. And so I think this incorporated some of the extrapolation concepts that I mentioned earlier, um, but also in the post-approval uh, space, we also required five-year follow-up of all the patients, as well as some additional aortic valve cases. And so I think this is also an example of an area where we use the concept of pre-post-market balance to be able to obtain data in the aortic cases. So that's one case study. Um, the second one that I put together is um, uh, for a device called the Amplester Piccolo Occluder. Um, and so this is a very small device. You can see um, the, the aspect ratio here um, uh, as it, uh, when it's it, um, put a, a, on top of a, a dime. So it's a very small device. Um, and it's intended for percutaneous closure um, of a PDA in, um, in pediatrics. Well, in, in not just pediatric patients, but this is predominantly a phenomenon seen in pediatrics. Um, typically, what we would require for a post-market study was uh, on the order of two to 300 patients um, for the larger sizes of this device. But because of how small this device was, it really was intended to be used in premature uh, babies or very, very young babies. And so um, the data collection in that population was again gonna be very challenging. Um, so essentially the way that we um, kind of pre came up with a creative plan was to collect data um, in a single arm prospective study. Um, and the study essentially enrolled about 50 patients at eight centers. There were 18 patients that were in the very low birth weight infants um, and, uh, and another 32 patients that were above two kilograms. Um, and so again, I think we drew from some of the experience of the larger sizes of this device in, in older pediatric patients to be able to, um, to, to draw from some of the effectiveness that we had seen and we supplemented it with smaller cohorts in these very young um, babies. And so this I think is another example of sort of a creative approach that we took to get a pediatric device to market. So um, happy to answer any questions uh, now or postpone until later, but that's, uh, that's all I have for, for now. You know, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. I appreciate both case studies. It's really interesting just to think about the numbers and, um, and logistics for some of these smaller patient populations. Um, there are questions coming in, but um, I'm going to hold off on the, the discussion portion until the end once all the panelists go. Um, so with that, Dr. Elpert, um, are you uh, wanting to go through your slides now, please? Be happy to. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I want to actually, it'll tag right off of, of what Nicole already spoke about, and it's talking about how to leverage uh, data. And I think it's important to remember that uh, pediatric populations are not one population. They're multiple populations. So we have the neonates, which, which she spoke about. But young children are not like middle-aged children, if you will, the eight to, to teenage years. Teenagers are not like younger children, and yet they're not like adults. And so we actually are dealing with multiple populations. So leveraging isn't always just one direct thing. And the leveraging that, that FDA allows, which is exceedingly helpful, wanted to enforce that exceedingly helpful and useful uh, for, for companies, uh, is that you can leverage from adults, particularly into teenagers. Uh, remember, pediatrics goes to age 22. Um, but even for teenagers. But for younger children, sometimes what we're leveraging 
is data from the older children and trying to leverage that. There are diseases in many cases where the presentation, the severity, the uh, way in which the disease impacts the child's life is totally different depending on the age of that child. So leveraging isn't always easy. And I wanted in the next slide, my example is one where it wasn't easy. This was, I can't tell you exactly the name of the product or specifically what it did because it's not mine, it belongs to one of my clients, um, but I can in fact talk about the issue. So the idea was to move from adults to broad use in pediatrics. It's an implantable device, happens to be in neurology, but it's an, an implantable device. And the questions that came up were how much leveraging? How much can you leverage? Clearly, as Nicole pointed out, safety sometimes needs to be directly evaluated by age group because young children are much more active than adults. Size is different, they're growing. Shocking, I know, but they're growing. And so you, when you have an implantable device, how do you account for that? How do you, how do you make sure that it remains safe over the growth of a child? How do you design it to do that? So there are different questions. Here, the issue was broad support across pediatrics. Implantable, already approved for greater than 18. So the older, older children, um, pediatric population, the, the adolescent population was covered. But the company really wanted to go down quite young, but would start with 12 to 17. Again, it, in leveraging going down by group, because the disease presents differently and because growth is different and sizing is different and the amount the way in which the device works has to be geared for the age group um there were challenges we already spoke about safety but growth and development physical activity quality of life and social impact two things we don't always think about when we think about pediatrics but we need to so the quality of life of a child who's eight is a very different issue than the quality of life of a child who is 16. We need to think about the impact that our devices have on their quality of life, on their social development. Will they be able to participate with their peers? What are the limitations? And will they need assistance? So in leveraging, we need to think about age group, the disease, the product itself, by size or by activity. Sometimes you can, you can uh, program devices for different rates of delivery of, of therapy. Well, what, what rate of delivery of therapy is appropriate for that specific age group? Again, very different in young children, in mid-group children, or in adolescents. Uh, and how much data is enough. This company's experience was that they needed to do an actual study. A study needed to be done because although there was evidence in 18 to 22, there were off-label cases for patients between 12 and 18, which they had, but it wasn't broad enough safety data. And therefore FDA did require safety information as well as some efficacy to be developed even for those 12 to 17. My, my point here is when you're developing a novel device for pediatrics, you have to think about the different age groups. You have to think about how much leveraging you can do, what kind of leveraging you can do, and what types of data you will need to support either safety or safety and efficacy in order to do leveraging in general, and in order to have small enough studies that they're doable, but impactful enough that they provide the information to FDA. And then of course, the plan to continue to develop data in the post market. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop and uh, wait for questions on the practicalities of implementing some of these uh, wonderful programs, but the practicality for the innovator, especially when it's a small company. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Albert. I'd, I'd be interested to hear more in the open portion about, yeah, your experiences at the FDA and with companies and how 
the two should work together and best leverage the the strength of each and then thinking too about large and small companies as you're in your consulting role now too happy to do that i yeah i've worn all the hats <laughs> <laughs> wonderful all right now we're on to dr reuter, dr. reuter. awesome uh, well, thank you for the invitation. It's a privilege to join this uh, distinguished uh, panel and to uh, add to the case studies. Uh, I also very much enjoyed the discussion and presentations this morning. Uh, if there was a bit of a theoretical premise to the entire product life cycle, uh, my, my goal is to focus just on one case study, uh, the development of a cardiac implant capable of treating both adult as well as pediatric disease. Uh, you see I'm a general pediatrician. I see this analogous to uh, somebody can pick up a, a book on parenting and understand it theoretically, but until you're holding a toddler that's having a temper, temper tantrum, you just really don't know. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm involved in a number of projects, as Craig has said, but I, I'm going to focus this discussion specifically on the topic of mitral regurgitation. Uh, and again, my experience is that back in 2000, I started a company and I led the development of a cardiac implant from conception uh, through regulatory approval. Um, I'm gonna share some details of that effort, but what I want for the audience to be aware of is there's certain fundamental principles that we use at each phase of development. And so independent of the specific technology, my hope is that this example, this case that is gonna highlight uh, the path that any of us have either gone through or we have the opportunity to. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide lists the first four phases of, of development as I see them. Uh, we've heard people say before that step number one, phase number one, is to identify the unmet needs. Um, for me, uh, if I make it personal, back in 1995, there was an 18-year-old um, single mom that walked into the emergency room at Pittsburgh um, Children's Hospital complaining of shortness of breath. And she says, maybe I'm tired because I haven't slept for three months. Uh, but I got a chest x-ray and her heart was huge. She had heart failure caused by her pregnancy. Uh, we took care of her for about two and a half years. And uh, in the final year of my training, uh, we learned that Danielle had died, leaving behind her three-year-old son. And so this was the first experience for me that says that this effort to innovate and to make medicine better for those patients that depend on us is a critically important thing. Danielle's disease was interesting because it was heart failure, but it has a close enough variant in the adult world that I knew we could develop a device for adults, take advantage of the $70 million in venture capital money that we had to raise, and then would eventually be able to bring it into the pediatric population, at least as Dr. Alpert said, you know, that the adolescent population. But as a pediatrician, there are a variety of different, very specific, rare, unique cardiac um, conditions. And the image on the bottom right, there's a patient with truncus arteriosus. There's four chambers to the heart, there's an aorta, but there is no pulmonary artery. And so it's an example of one of the cyanotic uh, diseases. So step number one, I think from a pediatric advocacy standpoint is to understand the relationship between pediatric and adult pathology. Phase two of innovation is the analysis phase. And having now done this three or four times, my personal opinion is that this is the most important part of innovating a novel technology. And Purdue taught me this. You have to study the problem in extraordinary detail, right? You have to identify every single variable, <clears throat> variable that's contributing to the pathology because what you need to do is to align those different variables in such a way that you can come up with a, a blueprint, a design of what that device is going to look like. Um, there's a lot of value in that creative process, uh, specifically for the innovator. We can see in our minds before I've ever made anything what that device is going to look like, and you capture that in the intellectual property, and down the road when somebody needs a return on the investment, that IP happens at this early critical phase. From a regulatory standpoint, uh, that device blueprint uh, is called a product requirement document. Um, and all the different variables that can cause different uh, issues clinically, uh, I believe it call it a hazard analysis. So this is starting to assemble the uh, material that's gonna be uh, submitted to the agency of, um, eventually. Again, if we take the pediatric angle to this, we're all aware, as I've already said, that the pathology in kids is a lot more variable than adults. 
Um, I looked at 100 different hearts, half at the University of Washington, half in Minneapolis, Jesse Edwards collection of hearts, and just to look at adult disease, which is less variable than kids. And I think that's one of the challenges. Um, phase three is the iteration phase. Once you know what the device needs to do, then you need to come up with something that does it. Um, you don't have to be um, creative or brilliant to start. You just need to start with anything. Uh, top left is, an, is the uh, first device that I came up with. And when we put it into an animal, it was an 80% failure. It rubbed against the tissue, it eroded the tissue, there's blood in the pericardium, the animal's gonna die anyway two days later and it did. Um, you study that failure mode and you come up with the next iteration. Um, that second device was about a 50% failure. But again, this idea of analytical thinking and let me understand the failures and iterate the design so that you can prevent all of those different failure modes. Again, from a regulatory standpoint, not only are you going to submit some sort of design history file that says, this is what we did and why, but in my mind, more importantly is, you can present to the FDA that failure mode and effects analysis. I've seen all these problems. Some of them I created on my own just to see what's gonna happen in a clinical setting. And here's the design of the device that we've um, generated in an effort to prevent those failure modes. So. Um, I personally think that really clear communication with the, with the agency, not only what have we done, but why have we done it? And let's make sure that we take our expertise and share it in a way that, that some sort of a unique device can be thoughtfully evaluated uh, is important. Um, the fourth phase is the testing phase. Um, it's, a, it's a critically important decision step to say, when do I freeze the design of a device? and move into testing and eventually clinical testing. Um, testing is going to involve both bench testing, animal testing. And again, this is where that analysis phase was so important. You need to set the boundary conditions. Um, what are the forces that the device is going to experience? What's the range of motion? You see a picture there of a fatigue tester. That might be two years, $10 million. This is some of the verification testing that you do on a device to say that design that we told you about at step one now we've tested the device and we're proving that it does what we told you it's going to do. Um, again, the challenges for pediatrics. It is extraordinarily difficult. You know, I, I did a hundred different animal studies in three different animal models, trying to take a specific anatomy or physiology of an animal that I was trying to extrapolate to a person. And that's just trying to mimic a, a, an adult disease, which is more homogeneous. So how do we justify different boundary conditions for some sort of pediatric pathology like a truncus arteriosus? Next slide, please. Um, as Andy Farb said, there's only so much that you can do uh, theoretically and on the bench top. At some point, you have to get into the clinic. Um, I so appreciate the FDA's dynamic uh, and evolving um, um, program. Uh, when we started in 2000, the EFS program did not exist. Uh, there was a lot of uh, discussion uh, between industry and the FDA and huge uh, credit to them for generating this EFS that really allows us to compare what we predicted, what we, what we saw in an animal setting. Um, did we make the device robust enough that it can withstand human physiology? And you see in that picture of the, of the device that, uh, that uh, we generated, um, that there's a fracture of the device. And so this is proof that you learn some important lessons, sometimes in the first five or 10 patients of a clinical study. So we do not want to subject 30 different patients in a phase one study to a risk. If we can put a device in, learn some critical um, insights as it relates to the safety, the adverse events, serious adverse events, and iterate again, that EFS study is a, is a really thoughtful and valuable um, uh, manner to do that. You'll notice the uh, phase uh, six, I believe, we're iterating again. And you'll notice how this time the iteration is incredibly subtle. We simply twisted the, the uh, wire forms from the top of the device to the, to the bottom, but there was a stress point. There's some very, there was some fatigue analysis that we did. And in some ways, I think this highlights just just the 
incredible attention to detail that's required for a device to make it from conception into the clinic and all the way to commercialization. Um, and then once you have a device that's going to withstand the environment of, of um, clinical physiology, you then embark on the more robust clinical uh, studies, phase one in the randomized study. Um, in my mind, the purpose of a phase one study, you've already shown that's going to be safe in the EFS. So for me, the biggest thing we can do in a phase one study is not only confirm safety, but you want to test drive different primary endpoints for a pivotal study. Um, part of the dialogue earlier was how do we get venture capital to support any given idea? And I can just tell you that um, if you're going to innovate, failure is not an option. Um, if, an inno if, a, if a funder doesn't see that you're going from point A to point B to point C, D, E in a very systematic, thoughtful, efficient manner, you're not going to get that 40 million to do the, the pivotal study. Um, one last personal um, anecdote, having um, proctored many of these um, phase one studies all around the world. Um, we had a very productive site in uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And like once a month, I would travel there to proctor one or two patients. And we had done maybe eight or 10. We're getting really good results. We had a great um, interventionist that we were working with. And about my eighth trip there, there was some gentleman standing in the back of the cath lab. We finished deploying the device. And he comes up to me and says, hey, David, I'm, um, I'm head of pediatric cardiology. We've been watching your implant. We've been talking about it in the institution. I've got a 10-year-old patient with truncus arteriosus, and I think your device would work well for them. Would you be open-minded to making it available in a capacity similar to this HDE? And having taken 10 years of my life devoted just to innovating something as a pediatrician trying to do it for kids, um, it was an interesting decision point for me to say, no, I'm not interested in that, right? As a physician, you take care of one patient and you do anything you can to make that patient better. But as an innovator, I was developing a therapy, a therapy, and I, need, I knew that our therapy was still in a vulnerable position because we just had a fracture. We're just starting to get some new clinical data. We hadn't created momentum enough and respect and data, et cetera, for the therapy to go the distance, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a very interesting dichotomy of what are you advocating for, a patient or a therapy? And it really begs the question, what is the right time to take that risk? So my final slide in less than a minute is um, you know, discussion points as needed. When you're in that analysis phase, it's just the fact that pediatric pathology is a lot more variable than adults what's the right time to invest the dollars and time to do that. Uh, the iteration phase, as I said, the clinical boundary conditions are more com uh, complicated. Which disease do we target first? Uh, the competition. Um, man, there was 5, 10, 15 of us all trying to develop a similar device, and we're all trying to help patients, but we're all competitive, and there's only a certain number of corporates that are going to help us get to the next level. We highlighted each other's issues and weaknesses, and so there is a decision point of what is the right time to take a risk with a unique patient population? You don't want to make the company and therapy vulnerable. Similar with reputation, one develops a reputation in the investor and medical community, uh, the regulatory community, as, uh, I suppose, as well. Um, and that reputation is impacted by the first impressions of the therapy. So what is the right time to take that risk in a um, unique population like pediatrics is? And then patient care, as they already said, as an innovator, it's just fascinating that the loyalty is to the therapy, not to the individual patient, so that eventually thousands or millions of people might benefit. Um, and so these are, these are judgment calls, but they're just incredibly important to get right. Uh, thank you for the time, and I too look forward to discussion um, questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Ryder. So you went from 90% mortality to 50%, I'm assuming third generation got better than that. You were doing a higher, higher, uh, lower mortality rates at that point? Well, none, none of it was mortality. All of it was just, um, sheep studies and yeah. sheep studies yeah. in Australia with the, with the animals. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was wonderful. Mortality was good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. And now we're going to move on to Dr. Devlin and I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and Dr. Devlin, I'm going to let you go ahead and share from your end. Hopefully you should have that 
function from your screen. Perfect. So we see you. Perfect. If you go down and hit share screen. Wonderful. So we, I am not hearing you, Dr. Devlin. Um, I wonder if we can figure out your audio. Is there a microphone setting you could try? One second as we uh, figure out technical difficulties. Okay, so while we're doing that, actually, let's let's jump into then one question, um, just so we're not wasting everybody's time. Um, so, Dr. Denny, you, you were interested in asking a little bit about um, uh, IRB oversight for these HDE devices and exemptions. Um, yeah, um, are, just are you available? Yeah, go ahead and ask. Yeah, um, so, so the I'm I'm a, I'm a longtime IRB member and chair, and HDE things come up occasionally and I can anticipate what the IRB member says, which is why are we involved in this and what are we supposed to do with it? Um, and I, just my experience um, over multiple reviews is that I don't think this adds anything um, to, um, to the process. Um, I'm clearly in favor of robust <coughs> oversight and review of, um, for, especially for, for children, but I don't think this adds anything. And, and I was wondering, <clears throat> has the FDA actually looked at whether they're accomplishing anything by this requirement and whether they've considered eliminating it? Dr. Ibrahim, do you want to start with that? Sure, I could start. Um, so I think it's a great question. And, um, and I've actually heard very similar comments over the years, not only from um, IRB members, but um, even more so from from the users, from the physicians themselves, um, kind of trying to get a better understanding of what the utility is of the, the IRB uh, approval process for the for HDE. Um, and I don't know that, uh, I think, you know, the question was asked, have we have we ever reevaluated or thought about whether it accomplishes what we had intended it to accomplish? Um, and I don't know that there's necessarily been reevaluation. I'm not, uh, so the, the um, HDE, uh, pathway is, as you can imagine, not um, utilized that often, uh, but I don't know that we have necessarily kind of gone back and looked at um, the utility thus far. Um, I will say, and I think you're probably aware, um, that the idea behind it was to make sure that for a device for which we don't have um, established effectiveness, that we wanted there to be some additional oversight on use of the device um, to, to be able to mitigate some of the, the, you know, the issues associated with demonstrating probable benefit. So that was really the solution uh, that we developed um, to get at that. But uh, I do think that it is something that, like I said, we've sort of heard from a number of different stakeholders that um, it not only maybe doesn't add to the add value, um, but also that it can create barriers, particularly for devices where they're used in emergent situations and obtaining IRB approval might be dif difficult or, you know, can, can kind of add um, some level of burden to the process. And so I think it's a, it's a valid question and worth uh, evaluating and something that, you know, I will certainly take back as well. Dr. Uh, Alpert, yeah, go ahead. Add one thing. I, I, was, I was at ODE when we initiated HUD and HDE. And one of the goals was that the hospital and the clinician recognize that full efficacy data doesn't exist, that there is some, some unknowns in HDE and to be able to differentiate. And that we put that in in the beginning because it's really important when, particularly when you launch something like that, that the, the end users 
actually recognize what that data is. They rely on the FDA to tell them that things are safe and effective. If there's, if there's a question or if there's less data, we felt it was very appropriate for them to know. At the beginning of the program, every patient had to sign consent. I mean, it was like it was a clinical trial. Now it's, it's not like that, it's not as rigorous, but it's still making sure that the institution is aware. So I think, you know, it's worth discussion. Great. Um, Dr. Devlin, are you now on audio? Can you hear us? Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, um, apologies. Uh, no problem, no problem. Um, why don't you go ahead and share your slides and then we'll come back to the IRB question. Dr. Dr. Heisey from uh, I think Med Institute wants to con consider from the med device side over IRB oversight and whether it should be kept. But All right, Dr. Devlin, go ahead. Okay, thank you for your patience. Uh, no it's problem. an honor to be here. Thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, everyone's here for the same reason as we know. Uh, there are unique considerations for pediatric medical devices compared to adult devices. And these considerations generally fall into broad categories that we're speaking about. Uh, there's a great need for flexibility, as we've been discussing, regarding developing pediatric medical devices. And to an extent, this is built into our regulations. You know, our re regulations re rely on valid scientific evidence, and these regulations allow us to consider many different types of studies and data, including real-world evidence. In our sessions, we've been uh, uh, sharing our interest in reviewing development of novel devices from the design and development through uh, clinical studies all the way to submission of a marketing application which ultimately enables FDA to review and approve these uh, devices. What are the main pathways? We've gone over some of them, but to just run through the main ones that all play a role in pediatrics, we would say the 510k pathway uh, it's most commonly used in the United States. Uh, our goal in this pathway is for the submission to demonstrate that a new device is substantially equivalent to a legally marketed device called a predicate. Although performance data are typically required for traditional 510Ks, clinical performance data are requested only for a small number of submissions. The de novo pathway is used when the risk level of the, of the device does not warrant the pre-market approval pathway, but the sponsor and FDA are unable to identify predicate devices to support 510K substantial equivalents. Granting of a de novo classification request authorizes marketing of the device in the US and also creates a new classification regulation. The pre-market approval pathway is reserved for the highest risk devices and requires that the sponsor provide valid scientific evidence to support a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness. The last way to market that we touched on was the humanitarian device exemption. This is for medical devices intended to benefit patients in the diagnosis and or treatment of a disease or condition that affects no more than 8,000 individuals per year in the United States. HDEs are exempt from the effectiveness approval requirement governing the pre-market approval pathway, but must show that the probable benefits of the device outweigh the risks, taking into account currently available devices or alternative forms of treatment. I was going to present three case studies uh, briefly on pediatric orthopedic devices to highlight some points about the different marketing pathways. The first case involves the 510k pathway. About 10 years ago, there was an unmet need to provide for on-label use of posterior spinal systems, which used pedicle screws for treatment of pediatric spinal patients. Although these spinal devices had received 510k clearances in adult populations, pediatric populations were not previously addressed. However, the situation was that these devices were widely used under physician-directed use, commonly referred to as off-label use, by orthopedic and neurosurgeons across the U.S. to treat pediatric patients. For 510Ks, we typically need performance data uh, to demonstrate substantial equivalence to a predicate. 
uh, as I mentioned, this uh, starts with uh, non-clinical data. And when these are not adequate, FDA may request clinical performance data. It's important to realize that a request for clinical data does not automatically mean a randomized clinical trial. In this case, our group was able to leverage existing published clinical data to advance the first 510K clearance for pediatric posterior spinal systems that use pediatric pedicle anchors for patients with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Since that time, we have cleared over 130 systems for use in treatment of a wide range of pediatric spinal disorders. Uh, it is helpful to be aware that the uh, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act defines pediatric populations based on chronologic age. Pediatric patients are those persons age 21 or younger at the time of their diagnosis or treatment. Pediatric subpopulations are further categorized as newborns, infants, children, and adolescents. However, in orthopedics, other factors such as skeletal maturity and growth have an equal or greater impact on device performance when compared to chronological age. So some of the takeaway points from this case, uh, in some ways it was ahead of its time. Uh, we now have more explicit regulatory tools and programs related to pediatric device development. Valid scientific evidence uh, to support uh, device approval can com come from multiple sources and multiple types of data. It's very important to carefully define the target population for a pediatric medical device. And finally, reaching out to FDA and interacting early is strongly encouraged. The next case I'll touch on is a humanitarian device exemption pathway and development of a device for fusionless, fusionless correction of pediatric scoliosis. The traditional treatment for uh, pediatric scoliosis involves a spinal fusion. During the surgery, rods and screws are used to correct curves and serve as an internal brace, which holds the spine in a corrected position while the bones grow or weld together in a process called spinal fusion. While curve correction is excellent and reliably achieved, the treated section of the spine does not function as a normal spine as it does not bend or grow, and additional surgery may be required to address both short and long-term events. Uh, since the 1950s, there has been great interest in developing reliable methods for fusionless correction of spinal curves. It was known that in skeletally immature patients that growth of the spine could be modulated based on understanding of how bone grows in relation to mechanical forces. This has been referred to as the uter volkmann law or principle. Initial device development in this area was somewhat chaotic with surgeons developing many different types of devices by modification of devices legally marketed for use in adults and using these to treat pediatric patients in their clinical practices through physician-directed or off-label use. However, there were limited data available to guide this use uh, and no uh, organized data on long-term outcomes of such treatment and clinical research to evaluate these new devices required an investigational device exemption. As physicians were uh, initially reluctant to pursue these studies, FDA worked closely with physicians, medical societies, and the scoliosis community to address this challenge. The first development was that some leading physicians stepped up and became sponsor investigators and worked with FDA to obtain IDE approvals to study new devices at their institutions. Subsequently, one device manufacturer sponsored an IDE study, which led to an application for a humanitarian use device designation and subsequent submission of data to CDRH in support of a humanitarian device exemption. The clinical evidence consisted of a single center study with two-year follow-up and provided adequate data to support the safety and probable benefit of the device. As the treated patients were skeletally immature and the study endpoints were based on two-year data, there was some uncertainty regarding the ultimate treatment outcomes as many patients were still growing and their curves had not been assessed at the end of their skeletal growth. As these devices had shown great benefit to patients, it would not be in the interest of patients to delay their availability to await these longer-term outcomes. 
Through creation of robust post-approval registries, CDRH was able to balance pre-market and post-market data collection requirements, and this led to marketing approval of the first pediatric spinal device for fusionless correction of pediatric idiopathic scoliosis in 2018. So the takeaways from this case would be that the humanitarian use device is uh, intended to benefit patients uh, in the treatment or diagnosis of a disease or condition that affects or is manifest in no more than 8,000 individuals in the US per year. Marketing authorization involves a two-step process. First, obtain a humanitarian use designation from FDA's orphan, Office of Orphan Products. Step two, submit an HD, HDE application to the appropriate uh, FDA pre-market review center. Uh, the HDE approval, as was mentioned, is based on safety and probable benefit. The last case I'll present involves a de novo classification process or pathway and is about addressing the unmet need to develop a novel device for use in the repair of a torn anterior cruciate ligament in a young active population. Suture repair alone of acute ACL injuries is associated with poor healing rates and outcomes. A new device solution was needed to serve as an alternative to ACL reconstruction, the current treatment, which involves tendon graft harvest and is associated with risks of post-traumatic osteoarthritis. This led to development of a new device, a collagen-based implant to augment suture repair of the ACL by serving as a scaffold to bridge the gap between the torn ends of an ACL tear. Uh, this bridge-enhanced ACL repair implant is a cylinder-shaped device as shown in the upper left. It's composed of collagen and extracellular matrix derived from a bovine source. During the surgical pr procedure as shown in the lower right, the implant is used with autologous blood to stabilize the gap between the torn ligament ends and protect the biologic repair process as it is resorbed and replaced by re uh, repair tissue. During the development of this device, FDA engaged with the sponsor at each of the key stages of product development. The device progressed from an early feasibility study to a pivotal study, and positive results led to granting of a de novo classification request in December 2020. Granting of a de novo classification request provides authorization to market the device. In addition, it classifies the device into class one or class two and creates a new classification regulation and the new device type, which is now regulated through 510K. The key takeaway points from this case are the de novo classification process is helpful to classify novel devices for which general controls alone or general and special controls are able to provide a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness for the intended use, but for which there is no legally marketed predicate device. It is a risk-based classification process and it provides marketing authorization and establishes a new classification uh, regulation. Devices are classified into class one or class two based on benefit risk assessment and risk mitigation measures. The new device, as mentioned, may now serve as a predicate for other devices. CDRH is committed to working with, with everyone here and everyone in the audience. Uh, as a science-based regulatory organization, if you bring your data and proposals to CDRH, we can guide you through our regulatory processes and our special programs. These include our new Breakthrough Devices Program and the Safer Technologies Program. Also, consider reaching out to us early through the Q Submission Program for assistance regarding potential or planned pediatric medical device development efforts. We're also very interested and work uh, uh, diligently to outreach to everyone who's developing pediatric medical devices. And here are some of the stakeholders we've uh, interacted with over recent years. I provided some helpful resources uh, regarding pediatric device development and regulation, and I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Devlin. That was wonderful. Um, go ahead and stop sharing yet yeah, so that we can go back to more of the discussion section now. Um,
to, to kind of wrap up the, the conversation then with the IRB oversight, um, Ted uh, Heiss, Dr. Dr. Heiss is um, from Med Institute. Are you on, Ted? Would you like to answer your question regarding central Could, IRB? Yeah, go ahead. I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So our experience uh, from the industry side has been the same as uh, Dr. Dan mentioned, and we've found that hospitals tend to be confused often about the requirement and what the purpose of it is, uh, getting the IRB oversight of access for use of an HDE. And I think in addition, when it's in the setting of a, a condition of approval study that may be required as part of the HDE, that adds not only uh, additional burden, but uh, some uh, additional op opportunity for confusion at the hospitals. They, they often don't quite get why they have to do two IRB approvals in the process. And so I guess for those reasons, I would agree with the other the speakers who have suggested that the topic maybe warrant some re-exploration. I completely get the, the reason that it was put in in the first place. Um, and I guess my follow-on comment would be that if after discussion it, it seems that there is value in keeping some IRB oversight, perhaps it could be simplified a bit by uh, mandating use of a central IRB for the process. The panelists want to have any comments on that? Dr. Okay, Albert, yeah. Comment. Um, so central IRBs are a great idea, but individual IRBs still need to work with the central IRB and agree uh, agree. So it's, it doesn't completely take it away, although it, it does take away the initial, the initial review process. Uh, so I think, you know, that's, that's something worth, worth thinking about. And it may be also that we should be speaking to, uh, I'm going to forget the name, uh, the H, the HHS level folks who deal with IRBs to make sure that we do some education, uh, to provide some educational information. Mm -hmm on their website about HDEs, which would be really helpful, as well as having some conversation at the annual IRB meetings about what an HDE means and why, why there's uh, a, an involvement of, of IRBs. That, those are just some things that, that could be thought about as a stepwise, um, a stepwise way to make sure that we still have the oversight, but, but take some of the, the burden off by doing broader education. Yeah, that makes sense. Sure. Go ahead. And just, just a brief comment, just in response to that. I mean, we, we go over that every time it comes up with the HDE. I just don't know that it's actually providing the oversight that you expect it to do. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, um, so, I, I mean, to your point about letting letting uh, physicians know that it's you know that it's not fully approved I, I think there are other ways to do that so I, I will leave it at that <clears throat> we need we need to have Nicole take that back to the IEP yeah staff. exactly <laughs> yeah, can, uh, I will. yeah provide that feedback um, Bobbin's got a question uh, Bobbin would you like to unmute and ask in person Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity as well. Um, sure. So uh, I wanted to understand uh, if an if a if a previous device had gone through a de novo pathway or an uh, or an uh, humanitarian device exemption pathway, and uh, now another company or even the same company has come out with uh, with a slightly improved technology and uh, would like to pursue that device. Uh, would they be uh, required to go through a PMA or an HDE all over again, or uh, is there a chance that it could also be a 510K? I'd like to, to tackle that question. This well, is I, good, I Evelyn. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so I think there are a couple of things, a couple of different scenarios that um, you, you've mentioned here. So. Um, if a device ha has gone through the HDE pathway and has, has received HDE approval, um, if they make changes to their device um, and it's, it's an improvement, it has the potential to just be a supplement to the original HDE. 
if indeed it's a different device or maybe a different manufacturer developing a device that is an improvement, um, and it's, this, it's of the same device type treating the same patient population for the same indication, um, then they would not be eligible for the HDE pathway because HDE is intended for devices for which there's no alternative. Um, so the only other option would be either a 510K or PMA, depending on if it's a class two or a class three device. I, I think, I hope that addresses the question. Or do know. Yes, thank you. And I will say, I'll maybe just add one other comment that if the second company decides to go through the PMA or, or um, de novo pathway, um, then the company that holds the HDE, their HDE would no longer be uh, valid, I suppose, because now there is now there are two devices available to patients, and so they would have to then submit for a traditional marketing submission, either a PMA or 510K. Very interesting. Dr. Fearnot, do you, do you want to unmute and ask your question about legislation? Yeah, we just talked about um, HDE and, and as you know, um, that HDE has regulation has, or the legislation has been changed every few years, every several years anyway, um, since it was started. And um, I wonder if this upcoming um, Madufa negotiation has any chance of including fixes to the HD that would remove a couple of those elements that really haven't been serving us well? Any you want to comment on that, Dr. Alpert? Say that there's the option. One of the options is to talk to the negotiators, and on the on the industry side, it's Advamed and MDMA right. who can bring things to the table. So it might be. It might be uh, worthwhile to, it, you know, I don't think we know what's what's on that agenda yet because that agenda is still being developed. But from the industry side, you could talk to the, the people who represent the industry in the negotiation and see if there's room or appetite to uh, to do that. But that's how, just for everybody else who doesn't who isn't as familiar with the process, it's every five years we renegotiate user fees. And at the time of the renegotiation of user fees, something I've done three times in, in my career, um, is to identify issues that, that either the industry or FDA wants to change in the law. It's an opportunity because the law is open. And so there's an opportunity to make changes to the device regulation, the device actual uh, statute at the time that user fees are negotiated. So there are many times when something new will be added or something will be modified in, the, in that cycle. We're in, we are at the very beginning of the next cycle for user fee. The, those negotiations are just beginning. And so to Neil's point, this is an opportune time to raise some of the things that industry might want changed in current law or new law, because this is the time to do it when the statute is open and when the, the discussions are taking place between the industry and the agency, and then that agreement will be presented to Congress for their consideration uh, alongside the fee changes. It seems like to me that we've, I've heard numbers, I have been in numbers of these discussions about HDE, and it seems like everybody would like it changed. The IRBs aren't happy. The FDA has not been happy. Industry's not happy. I don't know of anybody who's happy, actually. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I know that was a question or not, Neil, but I'll, <laughs> maybe I'll just comment um, in response. So I will say, and I'm speaking, of course, from the cardiovascular side, and Dr. Devlin, please feel free to um, give a different perspective from orthopedics, but I will say in cardiovascular, we have taken a different approach or a different perspective to the HDE program in recent years. Um, and we viewed it as more of a, um, a, a milestone or a stepping stone to a longer um, regulatory pathway. 
Um, so, in other words, there have been a few devices. So, for example, the two of them that I can think of, there are three in, in the cardiovascular that I can think of. Two of them are pediatric devices. So, the uh, Berlin Heart x device and the um, Melody Valve, the Medtronic Melody Valve, have both, both gone through this, where they started out with a small study that supported safety and probable benefit, received their HDE approval, but then we worked with them to design the post-approval mar study market requirements um, and data collection to be able to gather the right data that they would then need to support safety and effectiveness for a PMA. And so it was it was more of a progression as opposed to an endpoint. Um, and, and I think that it makes a little bit more sense when you think about it in that sort of holistic view. Um, and, and it also makes the path to market a little bit, a little bit less um, scary maybe <laughs> um, in that you have these, these milestones that you can achieve on the road to establishing safety and effectiveness. So I hope that there, that there are more devices that don't necessarily get stuck in HDE land, but that, that we can really gather the data for so that we have the effectiveness data and the clinical community can, you know, really make use of, of an effective device. Yeah, I, I, this, uh, uh, Vincent, I would agree with Dr. Ibrahim uh, uh, precisely in the example that I presented on the HDE for the spinal tethering for fusionless correction of scoliosis. That was our rationale, because if we were going through a PMA process, that device would not be approved yet. It would still be collecting data to see what the outcome uh, was. So our thinking was if we can get some of the HDEs going, that's a great accomplishment because we never would have got the data that we have. And then we're expecting when we collect more from the registries that we could have those devices through a uh, de novo. Because in orthopedics, the majority of, of our devices are class two. We don't have a lot of class three devices. So the HDE to de novo will work very well for us in the future, we think. And one of the, one of the issues there is payment, which is not FDA's issue but it's the issue for the industry and working with CMS mm -hmm. and that that um, it's a little trickier to get reimbursement on the HDE side. You can charge for the devices, but they don't necessarily get paid what you want. Um, whereas if you continue to develop the data and do go to PMA, it's a very different, it's a very different process for reimbursement, both from individual insurance companies as well as from the federal government. So there are benefits. Again, having taking Melody through, there are very there are wonderful benefits for being able to do that, uh, and in terms of broader access to the device for the people you you developed it for, which is for the kids. Yeah, that's great, Dr. Ryder. Um, let me um, shift uh, shift topics if I may, just a little bit. I'm intrigued with the purpose of the CTSI and the whole purpose of this session, which is to generate innovation and ideas for our kids. And we've talked about ecosystems and I'm aware of at least a couple of different partnerships that exist and just curious how we can best leverage them. Um, we've got this partnership between Riley Children's Hospital, Purdue and Cook, where you can take complementary expertise and, and try to create some sort of synergy, uh, number one. And number two, years ago, Wade Clapp um, started the MD-PhD program within Indiana, and, and now IU School of Medicine, in collaboration with Purdue, has an extremely robust MD-PhD program. So my question to the group is, um, do we have an opportunity to use that resource, some sort of an MD-PhD student who, in the first part of their training, they just kind of they find that problem, they study the problem, they do that intellectual heavy lifting that I talked about um, early on. And again, you leverage the fact that you've got the insights of Riley's clinical data with the technical expertise of Purdue and let that be the formative stage, the IP stage, et cetera. You take advantage of Cook's proximity and say, we can now mature this and kind of get you through some regulatory steps and then maybe that MD, PhD student, by the time they're in clinical studies, they've generated some sort of clinical trial and they're the ones that are trying to um, push that technology forward. And maybe it's simpler, it doesn't have to be a cardiac implant, it can be a wearable device, but it seems like generating momentum is gonna be valuable. And if we want Indiana to be a go-to place, you know, you, you don't just 
get there. You have to build your way there. Ramp up so, to it, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I guess for for the FDA that might have um, insights on a number of different states, are there any other examples out there of collaborations and institutions that have taken that MD PhD brain trust and been able to generate some sort of uh, innovation, innovative momentum? And can the CTSI uh, effort, um, you know, take advantage of anything that others are doing and kind of get the momentum started here? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll add, I'll, I'll throw it to you, Susan, just a second. But um, right at Walden School, engineering at Purdue is, is closely connected to both Cook and Riley. And we're trying to build a true um, formalized consortium that's going to take advantage of and um, build the momentum and, and expertise of each of those institutions. So one of the MD PhD students in my group is Connor Earl. Um, Connor, if you wanted to join, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your recent efforts to identify unmet clinical needs at Riley and connect with Cook, uh, Cook Medical and uh, Cook Research and, and their efforts to develop medical devices for pediatrics. Sure, sure, I'd love to. Um, I'm having a hard time uh, starting my video, I think. We see your picture, that's fine. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I, that's what I look like. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, Dr. Roy, that's a, that's a great question. And so, um, yeah, I, one of the things that I've been working on is um, that uh, uh, as part of this, um, you know, collaboration between uh, Purdue and IU and Cook. Um, and, and to give you a quick background, I'm I'm an MD PhD student, um, first year PhD student in the lab with Craig. And um, I'm hoping to do exactly what you're talking about. And um, I've been, uh, you know, working as a liaison for for this consortium initiative, um, trying to identify uh, clinical needs um, for for others as well as myself, right? That I can um, leverage in my in my PhD and, and beyond. And so um, it, it's been a, a wonderful experience, and I think there's a lot of potential to. To grow that, and and I and I see that happening um, at Purdue uh, with Riley and and of course with Cook. Um, Great, thanks, Connor. Dr. Alpert, I'd let FDA talk about the pediatric consortia, but if you want an example for something that's not one of the formal consortia, talk to the folks at the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. They've been they've been working in that in that arena. They're not one of the formal cons, uh, funded consortia, but they have a pediatric consortium that's working on those those kinds of issues. Um, they also have a fellows program, uh, the Earl Bakken Fellows, uh, that, that work with them as well. So there are some really nice examples, but I'll let FDA talk about pediatric consortium. Dr. Ibrahim, do you want to mention anything about pediatric consortium at the FDA? Sure, I can start. Um, so the uh, pediatric device consortia are uh, there are five different consortia around the United States that are basically um, hubs to, to try to, and they're, they are, um, they're sort of headquartered at um, um, medical centers of excellence, excellence in pediatrics. And um, the intention is that they form a, a group that can help support and assist with entities that are developing pediatric uh, medical devices. And the consortia are funded through the FDA, so we receive a grant every five years, um, and uh, the consortia apply for the grant. And um, like I said, there's there's five of them, and their funding gets uh, renewed every so often. But but they offer um, regulatory services. They offer support for how to deal with um, uh, raising funding. They offer support for um, preclinical testing paradigm, so that there's a, a whole breadth of, of information and resources um, and support that they can provide for developers um, that are looking to bring a pediatric device to market. Um, and so they award grants. Uh, so you can apply for a grant if you're developing a device from any of these uh, consortia. Um, and I would say that the majority of what we've seen from the consortia are probably class two medical devices, although there are um, you know, a handful of class threes um, there, I would. I actually saw a presentation recently um, on a couple of the consortia, and I would say about 10% um, of the devices that come through the consortia make it to market, which sounds like a small number, but I think when you consider 
um, in general, the yield of device development and, you know, devices that start out in the, in the ideation phase, the number of devices that actually make it to market are quite small. And so 10% is actually not that bad. Um, and so, so yeah, so they, they're a, a funding source for um, a number of different device developers for pediatrics around the country. Awesome. Dr. Fearn, I was asking a little bit about the, the ship MD uh, nascent effort as well, right? Were you on some of the calls uh, a few weeks ago, Dr. Fearnot? Yeah, I just wondered, is there a way that CSTI um, in, in this group could um, become more involved in that program? Um, since Riley, is, it's a huge hospital for children. Yeah and has a tremendous database behind it with Regan Street and, and the other relationships, part of a big medical school. So I just wondered, why aren't we more involved and can we get more involved and what would those steps be? Thank you. Yeah, I would just suggest that you talk to, um, you talk to the, the folks running the, the pediatric consortia at FDA, but also talk to some of the consortia that are not in the funded group uh, to see how they're working. So as I said, UMN is one, there, there are several, there are four or five around the country uh, that are not part of the, that con the funded consortia that are, mm -hmm. that are funneling uh, government funding to, to, inno to pediatric innovation. But there are other, there are other uh, groups that are working in that same, in that same sort of environment, creating opportunities for innovators particularly from inside universities um, to move. And I think the other, the other group that you might look at are some of the tech transfer offices from the universities who also are, are working in, in that arena to try to get better at taking academic ideas and turning them into viable product by paying more attention. Universities about, about five years ago or so, maybe it's 10 now, uh, realized that they could actually uh, get some finances by investing a bit in their in the innovation that's taking place within the university and helping those those innovators, those professors and graduate students to make their products uh, enter the market uh, because the university owns some of the IP. And uh, many of the of the, the uh, of the tech transfer offices have have now become much more uh, facilitators to help academics who are not innovate who don't understand the the business of innovation. They innovate, don't understand the business and the regulatory environment, but create it create pathways for them uh, to get into uh, much much more of the of the actual uh, commercial marketing. So there are a number of things and. I'd be happy to talk about some of them because I, I know a few of them, but I think that they're uh, that you have to look at those as well. So talk to your tech transfer folks at the universities and see how interested they are because they might be a really good place to make some of this happen. Yeah, both them and the investment funds that universities are running could be somebody to consider for some of these smaller markets, um, devices that are gonna be maybe less um, of interest to the big medical device companies. but. That's great. Um, I did want to get to one last question in just the last few minutes. Dr. Denny, are you still on uh, and thinking about incentives and differences yeah, between? I, I just, I, yeah, I, go ahead. I'm sure this is not a new new topic for you guys, but you know, clearly the the combination of mandates and incentives is to transform drugs um, availability in children. And I know devices have kind of gone down a different path. Um, I know about the pediatric consortium. I, I guess I, from my perspective as part of the pediatric community, I would I would view that as modestly successful, but not nearly the success that drugs have have done in terms of uh, availability for children. So I just wondered if people had any ideas about proper incentives and or mandates. Um, and I know we have lots of industry people here. So mandates is always a, 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 a dangerous word, but um, <laughs> Um, that that might might help sort of move this along. And again, I understand that there's very different dynamics between drugs and devices for lots of complicated reasons. But um, but it, but it has been incredibly successful. And, and one of the things it's been really successful at is now 
um, at least on the drug side, there is um, consideration of children right from the beginning, which I think makes a huge difference actually. And I think even just conceptually, if that could occur um, with devices um, in a consistent way, that, that could be helpful. I find my, yeah. I jump in for one quick second and say, uh, one of the big differences and one of the reasons why uh, F FDA does require that people speak to pediatrics, but there's a big difference between devices and drugs, and we spoke about it at this panel early on. On the drug side, it's the same chemical, it's the same drug, and you may have to make it an oral formulation, you may have to make it juicy and taste good, uh, but that's it. On the device side, it's frequently a total redesign of the device. It's not the same device. Um, and that happens frequently. So mandating that a device for adults be designed for children is not the same mandate at all. Um, and I'm taking that from the, the device side, uh, as well as as a pediatrician. So I think we just need to, we need to, uh, FDA does want and does require that people speak to whether or not a device can in fact be used in pediatrics, but I think we have to be careful around mandates because this is not at all the same industry. The products are not at all the same of the same types. Uh, the, the change that would be needed is sometimes a totally different product, totally different materials, totally different design operation. So mandates don't really lend themselves to many areas of devices, but I think making pediatrics front and center, and if you haven't seen the SHIP, Jeff talked about SHIP, go online and look up SHIP, because that's an effort that's going on between FDA and, and industry and, and the academic community to facilitate the development of more devices for children in a much more organized and much more visible and much more supported and collaborative way. Yeah. Any other comments from the panel? I'll make one yeah. more comment, uh, just piggybacking off of what Susan mentioned. Um, I, I don't know if it's necessarily incentives or mandates, but I think one of the big differences between drugs and devices is um, what doc, one of the things that Dr. Devlin mentioned, which is the flexibility in the regulations that we have um, in devices. Um, you know, there's uh, room to allow for a lot of different, a lot of creativity, I think, when it comes to uh, what evidence we would need um, for, for marketing. Um, and I think the, those are the, that's the type of tool. So we have a different set of tools, I think, um, in, in devices. And I think that's where um, we, that's how, those are the things that we use as opposed to the mandates and the, and the incentives um, on the device side. And, and you know maybe they haven't we haven't been as effective or we haven't been utilizing them quite as well as we could be. Um, but I think and I, I like to think that in the last couple of years we've started to utilize different tools in different ways, um, using the flexibility that we have in our regulations to be able to push things and move things forward for pediatric devices. Agreed. That that's a great way to wrap up. Um, I just want to thank the panelists again for their time and uh, insights. It was great to see all the different case studies and I really appreciate everybody in attendance for the discussion as well as wonderful questions. And I think there is a lot of momentum for uh, pediatric efforts, not only at, at Purdue here, but also across the state and through the CTSI mechanism. So um, we'll be following up. There's going to be a summary right after this. We've got uh, just a few minutes for um, break and then Dr. Lottis will be run, running a, a quick summary that will summarize all the breakout sessions. So stay tuned for that. And thank you again, panelists, uh, and everybody that's participated. You thank all you. Just a few thank minutes. you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.